King James I of England and V of Scotland is best known for commissioning the most popular book in history, the King James Bible. What you probably don't know is the scandalous and queer story behind the king. James was born June 19, 1566 to Mary Queen of Scots and her husband, Henry Stuart. James was taken away from his mother before he was even 12 months old. Due to her imprisonment for allegedly ordering the murder of her husband, he was raised by the court and by age 13, he was able to rule in his own right. He was known and admired for his chastity at the age and he preferred the company of male companions. Back in this period, 13 was seen as mature enough for marriage, and most kings would start inquiring about potential wives to help secure the line of succession. Although it wasn't usual, it wasn't out of the ordinary. And, as mentioned, he was admired for it. While at the tender age of 13, James's cousin, Esme Stuart, came to England from France to help advise the young king. Shortly thereafter, James began to shower his cousin, 25 years his senior, with many gifts and open affections. Define open affections, long embraces, granting him important titles when he wasn't qualified, and kisses on the mouth. Although kissing had more meaning back then, the fact James would show his affection at every opportunity was out of the norm. The court began to despise Esme, his seniority wasn't fair because everyone in court had to fight and gain qualifications to be there. Esme was also foreign and the court feared his foreign influence on the king. Their love was so strong that the Scottish lords had to kidnap the king and hold him hostage at a hunting lodge slash castle just to keep the men apart. The castle was greatly fortified in case Esme tried to free the king the lords or lord enterprises as they were called would berate the young king and pressure him to denounce his cousin and banish him back to france once this all happened esme returned a jewel to james called the great h of scotland this was bequeathed to james by his mother mary queen of scots he then had the heirloom turned into a glorified hat brooch and renamed it the mirror of britain in honor of esme Esme mysteriously died shortly after returning to his wife and kids in France. James was so devastated by the news, but Esme ordered that his heart be sent to James. Without telling his wife, he arranged for his embalmed heart to be sent to James, and it was. This all moved James to write a poem in honor of Esme called A Tragedy of the Phoenix. This was unique because Scotland wasn't known for poems or any kind of enlightened rhetoric. This trailblazing poem was about how the beloved phoenix died due to the hate and jealousy of the other birds and creatures in the jungle. And so as a phoenix does, it rises from the ashes, but in the poem, this part had a few sexual undertones to it. James was eventually pressured into marriage at the age of 23. Anne of Denmark was the best Protestant choice for him. So they had a proxy wedding. Then the plan was for Anne to come to Scotland, yet a storm made it impossible for her to make the voyage. This began a witch conspiracy, but maybe we'll cover that in another video. James did later retrieve his wife in person. They did have seven children together, but three didn't make it to adulthood. The deaths and miscarriages began to cause a schism in their relationship as well. During Anne's first pregnancy, James had a mistress named Anne Murray, to whom he wrote two poems about. In 1603, our icon Queen Elizabeth I passed away, and James quickly accepted the invitation to the English throne. His wife, Anne, moved with him, but this marked the end of their living together, and shortly after, their sexual relations ended as well. Yet serendipitously, James met someone else that same year. Now, this is where the story gets very messy. Robert Carr was a minor gentleman in England, and he participated in the tournament held at, in King James's honor. Carr injured his leg, and because it was the king's tourney, it was custom for the king to get the injured player medical attention. One visit was customary, 
However, eyebrows were raised when James made his visits a habit. Those who also broke up James and Esme began to quickly panic once they heard James offer Carr personal and private Latin lessons. Shortly after, Carr became the king's new favorite, created a gentleman of the bedchamber, Viscount Rochester, Knight of the Garter, Privy Councillor, Lord Treasurer of Scotland, Earl of Somerset, Lord Chamberlain, Keeper of the Privy Seal, and last but not least, Secretary of the State of England. And this isn't mentioning the honors and many valuable gifts he received. Same as Esme, Duke of Lennox, as he was better known, the court didn't like the new Earl of Somerset. And when the Earl made mistakes or didn't do his job well due to his ill qualifications for the positions, the court would quickly point out his incompetence to do his job. Carr made a very messy decision. Previous to James, Carr had two side pieces. One was Thomas Overbury. Idiotically, Carr hired his lover, Overbury, as his assistant, since Overbury did have qualifications. James knew what was up and demanded Overbury be transferred far away expeditiously. Russia sounded good to James, and Overbury denied the offer, a great offense, which ended him up in the Tower of London. Overbury begged Carr to get the king to release him. This failed, and after being in the tower for a few months, Overbury sent Carr a few letters. At first, Overbury would remind Carr of when Carr shared deep secrets with him while they were in bed specifically. The subtleness didn't work, so Overbury told Carr that he'd written down all Carr's secrets and would give it to the king if he was not released. Overbury must have been scared because he then let Carr know that the list was given to a friend who is to release the letter to the king if something were to happen to Overbury in jail. And shortly thereafter, something did happen. After five months of imprisonment, Overbury died and Carr had to frantically go find this list and Overbury's letters. This was useless because the investigation into Overbury's death was ruled murder by poison and the culprit being Carr's wife, whose name was Frances Howard. Frances was the daughter of the Duke of Norfolk and part of the most wealthiest court families. Frances didn't like Overbury very much for obvious reasons and political reasons. A trial was had, Carr might have been unaware of Frances' plot, but regardless, everyone including James thought he was guilty of murder along with four other men. Overbury's letters were used as evidence in the trial. Even if Carr wasn't a murderer, he was definitely guilty of abusing his power and taking advantage of the king. Carr, Francis, and four other co-conspirators were found guilty and sentenced to death. James let the four co-plotters die, but spared Carr and Francis by lessening their crime they retired to their estate together. Carr and James exchanged a few letters, but shortly thereafter, the letters stopped, and they'd never see each other again. And our player king, James, already moved on. In 1614, James had a stay at the Apathorpe Hall and met George Villiers, a 21-year-old minor gentry. At this time, Carr and James were still together as lovers, but the nobles focused on Villiers to help tear James from Carr. Carr tried to stop any attempt to put Villiers in James's court, but the nobles won, and Villiers was in. Villiers had great dancing skills and was a natural entertainer. The queen liked Villiers so much that she made him gentleman of the bedchamber. James wasn't the only one infatuated by Villiers. William Land, a court official who would become Archbishop of Canterbury, had what can only be described as a bicurious wet dream about Villiers, describing how Villiers crept into his bed and showed him the greatest of kindnesses. Just as Carr and Esme, Villiers saw a rapid rise in power and rank. His most popular title, however, was Duke of Buckingham. Unlike the other two, Villiers actually tried in his roles and found success. This, of course, put Carr out of favor with James and the court. Also, unlike Esme and Carr, Villiers stayed just as affectionate 
for the rest of the king's life. Villiers was 25 and James was hitting 60. Many in court found it embarrassing at times with the way and frequency and intensity that James and Villiers showed each other. James and Villiers also had nicknames for each other. For example, my dear sweet, sweet boy, Steeny, after the angel-faced Saint Stephen, and dad. Also, Villiers had often referred to himself as James's dog, which could be the equivalent of telling someone today that you're their gimp. This soon progressed to referring to each other as husband in letters. Also, James would imply that relations between a man and a man is more pure than relations between a man and a woman. A part of a letter from Villiers reads, I shall lose no time in hastening their conjunction, in which I shall please him, her, you, and myself most of all, and thereby getting liberty to make the speedier haste to lay myself at your feet, for never none longed more to be in the arms of his mistress, so craving your blessings, and I end your humble slave and dog, Steenie. This letter from Villiers to James is just one example of many. They remained loving towards each other all the way till James's death in 1625. It was found later that there were many passageways between the king's bedchambers and Villiers's bedchambers that were secretly hidden in the walls. Villiers, the faithful man he was, held James's hand and catered to him till James took his final breath. This is a very controversial topic. Many historians will say that these relations between James and his favorite were just examples of brotherly love. But if this is the case, why would his court be so embarrassed? His favorites would often share his bed, and James also dedicated poetry to these men, like he did his mistress. James did indeed commission the King James Bible. However, there are so many, even today, who pioneer religion yet turn out to be devious in the eyes of their faith and even their community. Hypocrisy is the human experience. James should still be respected for his achievements, even though he should have added the Book of Enoch to the canon, which is a great read, by the way. James's love life was hypocritical to the religious values he held. No one ever called him the Sodomite King, but maybe they just didn't have good gaydar. Or maybe they low-key like to watch. We can only speculate. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I just want to add that speculating on someone's sexuality is very weird, but our story today takes place over 300 years ago, and all involved are long dead. I mentioned the Book of Enoch today, an amazing story of Enoch mentioned in Genesis as one who walked with God, and what the wicked world was like pre-flood, during the flood, and post-flood. Angels flying down and impregnating humans, then their babies are born as man-eating giants. It's just a lot. Highly recommend, or maybe I'll do a video. Please let me know. Also consider subscribing and helping the channel grow. Be one of my first 1,000 subscribers. And I wanna thank you all for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments, good or bad, and take care.